Hello and welcome back. Um, let's take a look at this uh, ECG case number two from the Paramedicine 101 Facebook site. I actually ran this call myself. This is a call that I ran and I have some information on it so I thought I'd share it with the rest of you. It was a 53 year old female who we responded to because the the husband called. He thought she was having some syncope. He uh, in fact is a ex-retired uh, healthcare worker. <clears throat> and he was concerned. Uh, as we arrived on scene, I could hear him screaming, so I knew this was probably taking a turn for the worse. And he was unable to provide any CPR before us getting there uh, because of his own physical disability. So as I ran inside, I see this um, heavy set white female laying on the bathroom floor, a uh, pale, cool, diaphoretic, uh, not breathing, uh, no pulse present. So we immediately start CPR, we get her on the monitor, uh, after the first two minutes of CPR, I identify ventricular fibrillation, we shock her a couple times, give her some amiodarone and some epinephrine uh, throughout the duration of the case, uh, and she ends up getting a return of spontaneous circulation, first noted by the spike in capnography. So if you're not using capnography yet, remember that it's useful for more than just uh, ventilation and you should walk into your chief's office and show them all the research on capnography and demand it because it really is, uh, it's not a new thing anymore. We need to get capnography. So the, the spike in capnography let us know that we probably had a return of circulation. We checked for a pulse and sure enough, we had an organized rhythm and a pulse. We began the induced hypothermia protocol, which is you know super important. Um, there's maybe an argument as far as evidence goes as to when to start this protocol, but anyhow, we, we started it, we get her in the ambulance, and I do a 12 lead. A post-cardiac arrest 12 lead EKG is mega important. You got to think that uh, PCI, post-arrest PCI, is more beneficial for the patient than induced hypothermia, because it's going to improve their outcome more than anything else we do. So if this patient has a 12 lead that makes the argument for maybe transporting her to that further away PCI center it's important that you get it, right? So <clears throat> this 53-year-old female, uh, we did 12 lead on her. It showed a ventricular rate of 111. The monitor itself doesn't identify any P waves, which we're gonna double check, but it says that there's a narrow QRS complex, less than 120 milliseconds. And it shows us a little bit of left axis deviation uh, at the negative 64 range. And it reads this, acute MI, acute MI. So that kind of uh, we all know what that means, right? Look at the dang 12 lead and see if it's right. So we do. We look over here at the 12 lead tracing. And at first you might think that there's a wide QRS complex because all of this might look you know, like a wide morphology to you. But looking at it closer, if you look at lead 1, all right, um, you can see that lead 1 looks pretty narrow. And remember, if the QRS complex is narrow in lead 1 and your rhythm has not changed, it's narrow everywhere. Um, this QRS complex is this QRS complex is this one, right? So this monitor prints out three leads at a time continuously. This is all continuous rhythm. So looking at lead one, we just follow this QRS complex down and we kind of see that in lead two, the QRS complex begins here and it ends here. So it is narrow. It is a narrow complex. So what's all this? What is all this causing this complex to look wide? And I think most everybody on the Facebook site got it. This is significant ST elevation. If you look over here in the right precordial leads, it's most obvious. You have ST elevation in V1. This is the QRS complex going directly into the ST segment and the ST segment ending at the top of the T wave and coming down. So there's no real identifiable T wave here, but you know that it's got to be right about here just because you know that's where repolarization takes place. Also, I kind of skipped over it, but our rhythm is supraventricular. We have P waves here. If you look at AVF, look at lead AVF. You see the P waves right before every QRS complex, which makes a good point that that's the easiest lead on this 12 lead to identify the P waves. So if you were just monitoring in lead two, you might not have seen them, and you might have thought you had a wide QRS complex, which technically, being a rate of 111, that would be VTAC, and hopefully uh, you wouldn't end up treating it as such. So we see the P waves here, and we see this ST segment elevation, significant. This is called tombstones because you could actually write RIP 
You know, you write rip right in the middle of those things and it would look just like a tombstone. And because of the fact that it usually is very evident with uh, LED occlusions, which can be very lethal. In fact, this patient is a good example of that. Um, she was in cardiac arrest upon her arrival. If it had intervention not taken place, she certainly would have died. So this ST elevation in V2, you can see that the R wave kind of goes directly into the ST segment, and the ST segment ends at the top of the T wave. Same thing in V3, and in V4, you can kind of see that the R wave is coming down with the ST segment downwards. But these are all tombstone-like ST elevations. Nobody misses these, really. I mean, pretty much everybody can identify this. The ST elevation goes all the way across over to V5. Uh, you can't really identify it in V6, but again, you have a wavy artifactual baseline. V1, you can kind of see it here. And that, certainly in AVL, you have ST elevation, and you have reciprocal changes in 2, 3, and AVF. These are all ST segment depressions. So certainly, acute MI, that's, that's an easy call. We got to go to a PCI center. And that right there is going to improve this patient's outcome, knowing that. Um, also, the left axis deviation. Remember, we're doing this in a post-arrest state of an unstable patient. This is just a quick diagnostic 12 lead to know where we're going. This is not a get out the calipers and identify the left anterior fascicular block or even uh, you know, a right bundle branch block. Somebody's, somebody said a right bundle branch block. This, in fact, is not. If you look at lead 1 and V6 with a true right bundle branch block, you would have a terminal S wave in both of those leads. And it would be wide, and this is not as wide as it uh, initially may have looked. Okay, so we took this patient to the hospital, and she got cardiac cath. And this is what they saw on the angio. This is the first angio, uh, the pre-intervention. And you can see where it ends right here, this big vessel. That's the LAD. It ends right here. Okay, and look over here after they reperfused. This is where it ended before, and now we have all of this. All of this tissue over here was dying. It was very ischemic, and that's why. I mean, if you think about the amount of heart tissue and muscle right here uh, that was not being perfused, it certainly makes sense to why she went to V-fib cardiac arrest. Um, it, th these are both at different angles, so just pay attention. If you look at this electrode here, they did not move the electrode during the procedure, so that's, that can kind of give you an idea of the different angles. But this is where the LED ended before reperfusion, and this is where it ended after. And this kind of makes the case. So this patient ended up walking out with just a little bit of short-term memory loss. I got the hugger uh, weeks later. Uh, she was certainly happy about being alive and kind of whole new outlook. But this is a this would not have happened had she not went to a PCI center. Uh, she would have lost all this heart tissue for sure. Uh, the door to balloon time, in case you were interested, is set with 71 minutes. And from EMS contact to balloon time was 121 minutes, about two hours. That might seem like a long time, but remember, the, uh, the initial part of this patient's care was her being in cardiac arrest. So uh, a lot of that time, uh, you can look at about 20 to 30 minutes of that being her in cardiac arrest or being in cardiac arrest and packaging uh, for transport. Well, I hope you enjoyed this case. Uh, it was just a kind of a... Good case to drive home the point, obviously, uh, induced hypothermia, mega important. Uh, side note, this patient was starting to have some neurological improvement on the way to the hospital. She was moving. I called the, the physician and stated she's having some non-purposeful movements. Uh, would you like hypothermia discontinued? He, didn't, he did not want it discontinued. We continued hypothermia. He continued it all the way uh, into the ER and the... Uh, cardiac interventionalist continued it throughout the cardiac cath procedure. So she had hypothermia until uh, they discontinued it in the ICU, uh, you know, a little bit later. And she ended up having full neurological re recovery, I mean, except for a little bit of short-term memory loss. She can walk, talk, just like you and I. Uh, good, great case to drive home the point of post-arrest cardiac catheterization. So make sure you do 12 leads on all of your post-arrests. All right, take care now.